All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Some people were wondering, is Thomas really from Austin? And the answer is yes, I really am from Austin, born and raised. I love getting opportunities to speak uh, to audiences in Austin, which I don't get to do as often as I would like. I'd like to open up with a story, quick introduction, and it's about my first experience with my book table, or sorry, with, with crowdfunding. You see, uh, at Author Media, and uh, Sam Fagan, who's with us, uh, worked with us at Author, Fa Author Media for several years, um, we had this plugin that we were using internally because we were building author websites and we would build out these bookstores. And every author needed the same set of features. They needed a book page, a list of all of their books, and it was very complicated to build it by hand every single time. So we built a plugin for ourselves to help do that faster. And authors who didn't want to buy an expensive website from us were saying like, hey, we want to be able to have this plugin on our website. And we're like, oh, that's going to be a lot of money to build this. We don't know if anyone is interested. And in the olden days, that's where it would have ended. But now, in the days of crowdfunding, we had this other option. So uh, we also wanted to support more themes, but we didn't have the money to develop it. So we had this new option, and that was posting it on Kickstarter. So we posted the project on Kickstarter, and we basically said to the author community, is this plugin something that you want? And we set a goal of raising $2,500, and we started to promote it. We sent out an email to our email list, and we'll talk all about this more. Uh, we promoted it on social media. And after about a week, week and a half, it funded. We raised our $2,500. I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to make a WordPress plugin. And they're like, oh my gosh, we have to make a WordPress plugin. How on earth are we going to do that? But then what was interesting is that we still had three weeks left of the campaign. And people kept talking about the Kickstarter campaign and sharing it. And then we set up some stretch goals. We added some features. You're like, well, if we can raise more money, we can add more features to the plugin. And our goal was $2,500, and we ended up raising $12,000 for our book. And since then, I've gone on to fund uh, five plus more campaigns, uh, ranging between $2,700 and $12,000. And we actually have a Kickstarter campaign going on right now for the My Book Table 3, which just funded a couple of weeks ago. And for clients, we've raised another $50,000 helping them fund a book. I've never actually failed to fund a campaign so far. Uh, it may happen, and sometimes failing is better than succeeding. And we'll talk about some of the hard lessons I've learned uh, through success. But crowdfunding can be an amazing way to raise money for your book, especially if you don't have a lot of money. And as indie authors, you're sitting down and you're realizing how expensive publishing is. You're like, several thousand dollars for a good editor and you know, book cover. You can get the cheap one that no one will read or you can pay for an expensive book cover person. And when you're all said and done, it's three, four, five, sometimes $10,000 for a book. In fact, I recently crowdfunded a book and I, we raised $10,000 to fund it. And by the time we were done, all $10,000 are gone. <laughs> I, I'm not much of a writer and I spent most of it on editors because I needed it. I had three editors. I had an editor and then the editor had an editor and then we had a proofreader for the final version. And everyone's like, oh, it's so, the grammar is so good. And I'm like, it's not me. <laughs> it, was, it was all of your money that you put into uh, Kickstarter. Another great story though that I want to share is the story of the Pebble smartwatch. So about five or six years ago, these guys at Pebble had an idea. And they're like, we want to make smartwatches. And everyone was like, that's crazy. We tried smartwatches five years ago. There's no market for smartwatches. Smart watches won't work. They went to bankers. The bankers said no. They went to big companies. The big companies said no. And normally, that's where it would have ended. But they're like, we think there's demand for smartwatches. So they posted a Kickstarter campaign. I think their original goal was to raise like $100,000. They ended up raising $10 million for their smartwatch. And they invented the smartwatch category because Apple and Samsung were like, <laughs> like, maybe there is demand for a smartwatch. So a few years later, Apple comes out with a smartwatch. Uh, Samsung comes out with a smartwatch. And I actually have a Pebble smartwatch that I'm wearing. And it is two years better than anything from Apple and Samsung. So the Apple smartwatch has a one-day battery. The Pebble smartwatch, a one-week battery. It's a like totally different, better product. And it's cheaper. I really love my Pebble, by the way. Track steps, everything, it's great. Um, also, uh, virtual reality, uh, the VR headsets was another whole industry category that was developed and introduced to the world on Kickstarter. Now, these people have probably the best Kickstarter story. They tried to raise 2,500, they raised 2.4 uh, million, but then they sold their company to Facebook for, wait for it, $1 billion. <laughs> 
and that was after like 18 months of being around. They hadn't even, even shipped the product yet. Facebook wanted it and a bunch of other companies wanted it and they all bid, each, bid against each other. And now everyone that's in the next 12 months, watch for it, you're gonna see VR everywhere. And it started on Kickstarter. By not having to go to the guys in suits with the money, it opens up this whole world of possibilities for creativity, which for indie authors who don't have access to guys in suits with money is a great, great news. One final story, and my friends at Bananarchy. Has anybody heard of Bananarchy? Frozen bananas? Y'all are South Austin people, you know. They, <laughs> so they had one banana stand, and they wanted to open up a second banana stand, and they're a bunch of, you know, broke millennials. They don't have the, you know, $10,000, $20,000. And so what do they do? They post it on Kickstarter, and they sell frozen bananas in the future for money today so they can go out and buy their uh, stand, and now they have two banana stands, and they're able to sell twice as many frozen bananas, which I just love. Uh, although I still haven't cashed in my, my voucher for my free frozen bananas, so I don't want to do that. All right, so a little bit of introduction, and then I'm going to give you some tips on how to crowdfund. But first, I want to explain a little bit about what is crowdfunding. So the reason attendance is perhaps not as high as it could have been is that a lot of people are not familiar even with the concept of crowdfunding. Uh, crowdfunding is a new thing, or at least it seems new, but in, real, in reality, there's nothing new under the sun, and this is something that crowds have been doing for a long time. Crowds will pool together, donate their money to make something happen. If you've ever been to a church or to a charity event, that's crowdfunding. What's a little bit different now, though, is how crowdfunding works uh, online with platforms like Kickstarter and Indiegogo. So, um, you have an idea and you want to share it to the world, but the challenge is that you need money and you need connections. You need uh, to connect with people with power. And with the, old with the old model, you had to get that money from the guys in the suits. Either you had, if you were a company, you either had to get a loan from a bank or you had to sell equity uh, with a you know, in, uh, venture capitalist. And if you're an author, basically you just had one option. You had to give up 85% of your profits to the publishing company, which would then provide the money and the connections to make your book a reality. And that was more or less the only game in town. The new model, though, is that you get your money from your readers, from your future readers, where they pay you today for access to your book tomorrow. And what made Kickstarter so cool and so effective, one of those things is the all or nothing element. Who here is back to project on Kickstarter Indiegogo? Okay, so a handful of you. So the all or nothing seems like this very scary thing. Because it, it, let's say your goal is $5,000. If you raise $4,000, you know how much money you get? You get $0. And everyone who put in their money, their cards are not charged. Now, this seems really bad, but it's really good for two reasons. One, if you only raise $200 and it's going to cost you $10,000 to do your book, you do not want to be on the hook for $9,800. That's very scary. Because they're like, hey, they paid. You promised them your book. So you don't want to be put in that position. But the other thing that's really cool is that when you're at 60% funded, 80% funded, and time is running out, what do you think all your backers do? They go grab more backers. They go get their friends and their family, and they're like, you've got to back this project so that it so actually funds. And that encourages more and more donations. The other thing that's different somewhat is rewards. So with Kickstarter, people aren't backing out of the kindness of their heart alone. They're also getting some sort of reward. So for a book, the most common reward is the book itself. So you maybe have three levels. For 10 bucks, you get the ebook. For 20 bucks, you get the paper book. And for 40 bucks, you get the signed copy. Or you can bundle it in other ways, but that's kind of the core Kickstarter campaign for a book. And so they're, in a sense, they're pre-ordering, but they're also pre-ordering and feeling like they're contributing to the book. Then the other thing is that it's for a limited time. So there's always this countdown ticker, which encourages people to act now rather than procrastinating. Not Y'all are authors, so I know y'all don't deal with procrastination at all, but <laughs> normal people love to procrastinate, especially when it comes to paying money. All right, so there's three kinds of crowdfunding. We have equity-based crowdfunding, reward-based crowdfunding, and what I call feels-based crowdfunding. Um, we're going to be focusing on this middle one, which is reward-based crowdfunding, but just so if, you, if anyone ever asks you, equity-based crowdfunding is where you're giving away ownership in your company in exchange for money. So instead of asking a venture capitalist to give you a million dollars, you're asking a thousand uh, smaller people to give you 10,000 each. And um, so you're getting smaller donations, but they actually have ownership. For an author, you don't want to do this pretty much ever. 
And then GoFundMe, this is like if your cat needs surgery or something and you want your friends. Has anybody had the like my cat needs to go to the vet, like GoFundMe request? Yeah, so that's that. With GoFundMe, it's nice because there's no accountability. They're just expecting you to take the money and do something with it. And occasionally, if you get picked up on the news, there's people who've made millions of dollars on GoFundMe for their whatever it is that they're trying to raise money for. All right, so we're going to get into some tips, and I want to be able to get to your questions. So some of you send in questions ahead of time, and if you have questions, uh, let me know, and we will uh, at the end we'll get to them as well. Um, all right, seven crowdfunding tips. The first tip, which is perhaps the most important, is to build your crowd first. A lot of authors go on crowdfunding, and over half of books that get posted on Kickstarter fail to fund. And I think the number one reason they fail to fund is that they heard someone talk about raising lots of money on Kickstarter, and they think all they have to do is put their book on Kickstarter, and money will magically fall from the heavens. And trust me, if money magically fell from the heavens, there'd be a lot more people on Kickstarter. It actually requires work. And uh, you have to build your, dig your well before you're thirsty, build your crowd first. As a general rule, expect that 20% of your backers are going to come from Kickstarter. So if you need 100 backers to make your campaign successful, you need to bring in 80 of them yourself, and Kickstarter will provide the other 20. In my experience, I don't think I've ever had a campaign that had as much as 20% from Kickstarter. I've had some campaigns where as little as 2% of my backers came from Kickstarter, and I had to do it all on my own. Partly because authors aren't on Kickstarter, and so our products that target authors, just there's not much of a Kickstarter community to get going. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a technology product uh, often, or a board game, you may not need much of a crowd. If you can get people excited, the crowd already exists, and they're already looking for new projects on Kickstarter. Readers aren't looking for new books on Kickstarter in that same way, so you have to bring your own crowd with you. So dig your well before you're thirsty. So you may be asking, what's the most effective uh, tool for driving sales to a crowdfunding campaign? What do you all think? Of all the various online tools, how do you get people to go to your Kickstarter campaign? What works the best? <coughs> Who said that? Gold star for you. The correct answer is email. It's about five to ten times more effective than the next most effective thing. I have a whole talk on email that I give uh, at conferences. Maybe at a future talk uh, I could come in and talk to you here. But I will give you a couple of uh, simple tips uh, to build your email list now. I also, on the Novel Marketing Podcast, we have a whole episode on how to build your list, how to get your first 10,000 subscribers. It's totally free on novelmarketing.com. Uh, but a couple of quick tips. The first tip is to create a lead magnet to gain subscribers. Some sort of cookie, some benefit, some carrot that someone gets immediately for signing up for your list. As in, uh, who here writes fiction? Quick show of hands. Okay, and who writes nonfiction? And who's not quite sure yet what they're writing? Anybody? <laughs> okay, so if you're writing fiction, I recommend a short story. And if you're writing a series, have it be a short story with the characters from your series. That can be very powerful marketing. If you're writing nonfiction, I would put together some sort of guide related to your area of expertise. Some sort of tip sheet, you know, five or six page, ten page PDF that people get right away. Another thing that you can do is uh, give a drip campaign. It's kind of more an advanced tip where they get a series of helpful emails around a certain topic. I don't have a slide for this, but we actually have a free tool that you can download on if you, if you have a WordPress website that can help you build your list. It's called My Book Progress. It, sh it lets you show a progress bar of your book, and right underneath it, it's got a button that says Sign Up for Book Updates, and it integrates with MailChimp, so you can very easily gain subscribers that way. I can't tell you how helpful it is to have a big email list when it comes to funding on crowdfunding. All right, the next tip is to create a one-sentence value statement. Ultimately, the magic of crowdfunding is your people who've backed your campaign talking to their friends and getting them to back your campaign. To do that, though, your campaign, whatever it is you're selling, your book or your product, has to be so simple that people in one sentence can tell their friends about it. If you can't communicate it in one sentence, they won't be able to communicate it in one sentence, and it won't be able to spread. So a couple of examples. Pebble Time. It's a color e-paper smart watch with up to seven days of battery life. That's shut up and take my money right there. If any of you have had an Apple Watch, you just stress about the battery the whole time. And a new timeline interface that highlights what's most important in your day. Kind of long, but it raised them $10 million, so who am I to judge? <laughs> um, here we have uh, 
MyBookTable, a WordPress plugin to help authors sell more books. And then with my book Progress, we didn't come up with a statement, we just came up with three, six words. Show progress, gain subscribers, hit deadlines. And um, I loved Bananarchies. Help uh, Bananarchy open a second frozen banana stand. It doesn't have to be fancy. And y if you know who they are, you're like, the world needs more frozen bananas in real life and not just in funny TV shows. Um, the, and then they have the second one. The people have demanded more Bananarchy, so more Bananarchy is what we'll give. Um, I love their, their branding. All right, so the next tip, tip number three, is to create a campaign budget. Count the cost before you start your campaign. And this is often where a lot of authors can go wrong and get themselves into trouble. So uh, we actually created a spreadsheet to help with this uh, because I realize that a lot of authors don't like spreadsheets and so it's kind of a fill in the blank. But you want to calculate your budget in two ways. The first budget you need is how much it's going to cost to print your book. So you want to start talking with editors and cover designers and figure out where you're getting your book printed, which by the way, I really like CreateSpace. Um, but what it, wherever you get your book printed, here's a rule of thumb. Don't print your book with the company until you can find a happy author who printed their book with that company. That will save you from a lot of sketchy book printers. So they're, the ones that have the biggest sales forces and call you the most often tend to be the worst companies <laughs> uh, as a general rule. Anyone been with an author solutions company, Ex Libris, anything like that? Okay. Of course not. Y'all are savvy. You're coming to this group. You're being protected from that. <laughs> Have you, have you talked about like printing and books and all this already? Okay, so preaching to the choir, over. Moving on. <clears throat> you also want to calculate the cost of how many backers you'll need. So this can be very simple. You just put together your rewards, figure out how many backers are going to back each reward, and total it up to hit your goal. Um, and figure out if it's reasonable or not. So we need you know 50 people at the $10 reward will give us $500. We need, you know, 50 people at the $25 reward will give us 2,000, and you just add it up and you see what you have to do to get there. And then you can reverse that into your list. So I need 250 people to make my campaign a success, and I have 250 people on my list. I'm gonna to have to get every single person I have an email address for to give me money. Probably not going to happen. So you have to find other ways of finding those folks. But you, you calculate that ahead of time. Generally, people like to spend between $25 and $50 on Kickstarter which is kind of cool because that's more than people typically pay for a book. And so you can often make more money off your Kickstarter backers than you would off those exact same people when your book is out. And what I like to do to increase the value of what I give authors is to bundle the ebook with the paper book. So it doesn't cost me any more to give you a free ebook with the paper book, but you can't get that from Amazon. You buy the paper book, you have to pay another 10 bucks for the ebook. And so uh, everything comes with the ebook and suddenly everything is more valuable to the readers, and it, which allows me to legitly raise the price. Uh, also, finding other ways of adding bonus material, featuring their name in the back. Some people really like that, um, and it gives them a sense of ownership being listed in the back of the book, and all of those things will make, or you know, signed copy, although be careful with signed copies. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Do not have unlimited signed copies or your hand will fall off. <laughs> you, will wish, you will wish for death and it will not come. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, don't forget the Kickstarter fees. Okay, so Kickstarter and Indiegogo both, and I know I'm talking Kickstarter a lot, but I've also done campaigns on Indiegogo. We can talk about the differences. But they both charge about 10%. So if you raise $10,000, they're going to take about 1000 in fees. So you want to calculate that when you're creating your budget. They don't always take exactly 10 Sometimes it's lower, but it's nice to have a little bit of extra space there. Now, they only charge you if your campaign funds. So if your campaign fails to fund, you get all of the benefit of their platform and you don't have to pay anything for it. So in that way, it's very low risk. All right, so what I recommend is that you budget to break even with the minimum viable product, so especially for nonfiction, like the minimum number of chapters to make the book work. And then you can add bonus chapters as stretch goals to keep people donating and telling their friends about the project after the campaign continues to fund. Another tip, and this is a, a, a real pro tip that can help you fund more likely, is to try to get to 60% as quickly as possible. Why 60%? There's this magic statistic that 
a certain that uh, campaigns that get to 60, do you know what percentage of them go on to get to 100? 99% of them go on to get to 100. So if you can get to 60, you're almost guaranteed to get to 100. Your backers are going to put their shoulder to the plow and they're going to push you over the, um, over the line, which is really nice to realize we only have to get to 60%. And sometimes what uh, authors will do is they'll put together early bird levels that are limited and those early bird le levels will get them to 60% uh, to encourage people to back early. Early bird may or may not work. I've, I've done it both ways. Sometimes people don't like early birds because once it sails out, they feel like they're not getting a deal anymore and it can slow things down. So there's good arguments both ways. All right, another tip, share your budget. Uh, for a campaign I worked with a client on, she put this back of the napkin budget and she just kind of summarized, because people are like, $10,000? How do you need $10,000? My brother-in-law printed his book and he only paid 500. What are you gonna do with all that extra money? Well, she'd been traditionally published with a whole bunch of books and her readers are expecting a certain level of quality, which meant that she couldn't get the college student who just graduated with an English degree editor. She had to get a professional editor. And professional editors, especially best-selling level editors, typically are four or $5,000 for a book. Um, sometimes more, sometimes less. Some of you are editors here, and uh, if you ask around, there's, there's good ones and there's bad ones, and there's a bunch of different levels of editors, probably five different levels of editors. And we have an episode of this on the Novel Marketing Podcast talking about the different levels and about how much they charge and what you should use. But the, the top level is an editor who has edited a book that is two books that have been on the New York Times bestseller list. Lightning has struck for them twice. They're the most expensive kind of editor, and they're often worth whatever they charge if you can afford them. All right. Tip number four is to create an amazing video. Now, this can be kind of tricky because most of us here are not video experts. Although, fortunately for you, you live in Austin. And you cannot throw a, a stone in this town without hitting a semi-out-of-work video professional <laughs> who would be very happy to help you with your Kickstarter video if you cut them in on a piece of the uh, action. Sometimes they'll do it for free for a percentage of whatever you're able to raise uh, if you're able to connect with the videography community. And there's some good meetups, I think, some video people meetups you can connect with uh, to help you create a good video. But uh, some advice, watch Kickstarter videos. Watch lots of videos and lots of videos. If you're watching them for books, make sure they're for books that successfully fund. Uh, because there's a difference between the videos for the campaigns that fund and the campaigns that don't fund. And one of the biggest is how long the video is. The average length of a successful Kickstarter video of a Kickstarter campaign that raises over a million dollars is two minutes. It's actually like one minute and 53 seconds. It's slightly below two minutes. That can be really hard to get your message that concrete.